All right, let's just go through a quick little lesson on fluids and electrolytes to refresh your memory. Remember that water is a big part of every human being, right? About two thirds of the total body water is in our cells. That makes sense because we're made up of cells and that's what we are, so that's where the water is. About 8% of the water lives intravascularly and about 25% of the water is in a third space, right? It's not intracellular, it's not intravascular, it's a third space, and we call that the interstitial space. The cool kids call it third spacing when fluid collects there, but uh, we know that that's in, that is the interstitial space. And by the way, just for fun, you see these little filaments here, these pink filaments? Those filaments are actually part of the lymph system. All of this fluid that exists in between the cells uh, in the interstitium, this is all part of the lymph fluid. And these um, uh, thingies, these um, filaments, help direct that lymph fluid into different parts. And lymph is a fascinating thing all by itself because it has these enormous molecules that can't even diffuse across the artery or uh, I'm sorry along the capillary and that's why they exist in the um, uh, in the interstitial space then eventually that interstitial space moves the fluid to the lymph system and then the lymph system drains into the right atrium it's a fascinating thing, and I never learned that in college. I learned it when I started reading about this stuff more. So, um, lymph, just for your entertainment. What I want you to know from this slide is that we have intravascular, intracellular, and then the third space that we put place or put fluid is the interstitium, the interstitial space. Now we can move fluids in a couple of ways. We can move them with a pump, right? We all know about pumps moving things and the heart is the pump in the body that moves fluid. But the other way that we can move fluid is by changing the concentration of electrolytes. And so there's lots of electrolytes that are important in the body. The anions are the negatively charged ones and they include chloride, bicarbonate and phosphate and we always write them with that little negative sign because that indicates that there's a charge there and they are ready to mate with some other cation which is a positively charged um, uh, substance or ion like sodium potassium calcium hydrogen magnesium some others as well but that's the way that this works. When those ions are there, they're looking for a mate, that charge influences the direction of um, flow, all right? When the cations and the anions are all in equilibrium, that's homeostasis, and your body's always trying to get to homeostasis, right? Now, lest you think that there's minimal effect of these ions on fluid movement, let me just tell you about this. If you take a beaker of pure water, it's distilled water, it has no electrolytes or anything else in it, it's just hydrogen and oxygen bound together. And then you drop a U-osmotic cell. U means true. Osmotic means the osmotic pressure, right? If you take a regular cell with a regular amount of ions in it, that's U, uh, that's a U-osmotic cell, and drop it into that pure water with no electrolytes, the pressure exerted on that cell membrane will be 5,400 millimeters of mercury. That's higher than my blood pressure, a little bit. A normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. 
we're talking about a 5,000 millimeter of mercury pressure exerted on that membrane. So there is a ton, a ton of effect that one gets from these electrolytes and fluids uh, working in your body. Now let's take a look at what happens when we take a U-osmotic cell, shown here, and we plop it into isotonic water. So isotonic means that there's roughly the same number of particles in the water as there are intracellularly. Well, when we do that, there's no movement of water because it's perfect, right? It's in homeostasis. But what happens if we take a U-osmotic cell with the right number of um, ions for it to work and plop it into hypotonic solution? Hypotonic means that there are fewer of these little ions in the water than there should be, than, than in isotonic solution. Well, in this case, what happens is the water moves from the vessel into the cell to try to dilute the anions and cations in the cell. Make sense? Remember, when we're talking about osmotic pressures and things, the fluid is what moves, not the ions, okay? So when we take this normotonic or u-osmotic cell and plop it into hypotonic water, that water wants to get in to dilute the ions in the cell. Similarly, if we take a u-osmotic cell and plop it into hypertonic saline, now we have so many of these things and so few in the cell, now the cell wants to dilute the solution that it's in and it donates its water out of the cell and into the solution to try to dilute it again to try to achieve homeostasis. So how does this all work when we're talking about the macro perspective? We talked about the cellular effects. But what happens when we're moving fluid through a uh, system? Well, I like to think about it this way. There are three different pressures. Remember we said the blood pressure is one of those pressures that can move fluid, and we call that hydrostatic pressure. So the hydrostatic pressure is the blood pressure, the synonyms. The osmotic pressure is the number of particles in solution and the degree of ionization. Well, what does that mean? Well, for our purposes, we're gonna think that that um, tends to force fluids out of the vascular space. So sodium, for instance, when we have an overabundant, uh, I'm sorry, a, a low sodium then in the blood, that's gonna force water out into the interstitial space, which has higher ion concentration, and that will dehydrate them intravascularly, okay? And we have a little method for calculating the osmolality, and it's two times the sodium plus BUN divided by 2.8 plus glucose divided by 18, and if there's alcohol, then we divide that by 3.7. But what do you notice about this mathematically? Well, what you notice is, by far the largest component of this is the sodium, right? Two times sodium and we're not dividing by anything. Sodium is 145, 135 to 145 times two. BUN is what? 20 divided by 2.8. I mean, those are tiny numbers. Glucose divided by 18. We're talking about very small numbers for these. So when we talk about the osmolality, we can fake it. We can fake it and just, mm, darn it. We can fake it 
and just talk about the sodium. All right, for our purposes, the sodium is going to give us enough information about osmolality. Oncotic pressure, so we talked about osmotic pressure, which is from the sodium and the BUN and the glucose and all that stuff. But the oncotic pressure is very different. Oncotic pressure essentially is the um, pressure that tends to hold fluids in the vascular space. All right. So albumin, when you have low albumin levels, you get tons of edema. And excuse me, that's because there's not enough oncotic pressure that holds the fluid in the intravascular space. Okay. It's complicated to figure that out. So we'll just say it's low when the serum albumin is low. Is that fair enough? When the serum albumin is low, that means that the oncotic pressure is low and we're going to leak fluid out. And you can see all that put together here in this that has a little mistake. We'll fix it. So the blood pressure going into the vessel, this is the arterial end of the capillary, goes in here and it has a pressure of 25. The blood pressure is 25 millimeters of mercury. The osmotic pressure is 20 millimeters of mercury. That's a negative because it's going, it's pulling fluid inside the vessel, right? And that gives a net pressure of, this should be five, not 10, right? So that gives a net filtration pressure of five millimeters of mercury. That's forcing fluids out at a pressure of five millimeters of mercury. Doesn't need to be much, right? It just needs to be a differential. Now, as we keep going on the capillary, uh, on the venous end of the capillary, we still have a blood pressure, call it 25. The osmotic pressure, because we've donated so much more fluid over here, the osmotic pressure is higher now. And now we have a low net pressure of minus five. So it's those changes of concentration of the electrolytes that move the fluid and it's countered by the oncotic pressure which is really just the albumin right the amount of really big molecules in there like albumin when we're talking about patients we want everybody to have euvolemia right that's homeostasis where you have just the right amount of fluid in the vessels just the right amount of fluid in the cells, just the right amount of fluid in the interstitium. Everybody lives happily ever after. That's euvolemia, all right? But that's not the world we deal in when we have patients who are sick in the hospital. We oftentimes have hypovolemia where there's hypotension. Remember we talked about older patients are at higher risk for orthostatic hypotension. And in the summertime, they may go to the fair. They may be walking around, not eating and drinking enough. They may become a little hypotensive uh, and get dizzy and maybe pass out. All that due to hypovolemia. On the other end of the spectrum, we can have hypervolemia. And you can think of a condition that I treat quite frequently that would be associated with hypervolemia, right? Heart failure. That's one of those things that is caused by heart failure. You get fluid backing up, can back up into the lungs, it can back up into the veins and cause swelling in the ankles and other places.